This state was the first in the nation to lower its voting age for state and local elections from 21 to 18. The year was 1943. Greetings from Georgia, which joined the Union on January 2nd, 1788. With 9.3 million residents, it ranks as the ninth most populous state in the nation. From the Okefenokee Swamp to the nation's most productive peanut farms to the Deep South's largest metropolitan area, Georgia is a state of contrast and contradiction. Its colonial charter guaranteed religious freedom, except for Roman Catholics. Its capital city elected a black mayor in 1973, while a Confederate battle flag flew over the state house. Even now, Georgia seems to be not one, but two distinct places. Well, today, you basically have two Georgias. Inside Atlanta, you have uh, people from all over. It's a very urban area, and things are going on. You go outside, and it's rural Georgia. It still has a slower pace to it. So you basically have two, two Georgias. Then go to South Georgia, and the southern accents are more prominent and, and thicker. The old South is more visible outside of the city than within. The city is Atlanta, known as the capital of the New South. In recent years, Atlanta has acquired a global profile, thanks to a strong economy, the 1996 Olympics, a baseball dynasty, and an internationally renowned hip-hop scene. But for all its cosmopolitan flair, it may still be best known as the home of history's most enduring, recognized, and valuable brand. Personally, as a Georgian and as a native of Atlanta, I was always proud of Coca-Cola, and then when I could work with them, that was the best day of my life. I'm not kidding, it was. I mean, this is, to go to work for Coca-Cola, if you're from Georgia, it, there's nothing better than that. Coca-Cola was invented by a pharmacist named John Pemberton on May the 8th, 1886. Legend has it that Pemberton mixed up the first batch of Coca-Cola in his backyard in a copper pot using a boat oar. He then took this beverage to a drugstore in downtown Atlanta, where it was served to the first patron and was found to be delicious and refreshing. We started with one ounce of Coca-Cola syrup, added five ounces of carbonated water, jerking the handle back and forth to create a stream that mixed the Coca-Cola for me. And that's where I got my name as a soda jerk, from jerking the handle back and forth. Being the birthplace of the world's number one soft drink company would be a notable distinction for any state. But in Georgia, it's just one of many. In 1912, the Girl Scouts were founded in Savannah by Juliet Gordon Lowe. Wesleyan College in Macon, which opened in 1839, is the world's oldest college for women. And Georgia was the first state to grant full property rights to married women. Georgia's oldest city, Savannah, is considered by many to be one of the most beautiful towns in America. It was also the nation's first planned city. Founded in 1733 by philanthropist James Oglethorpe, Savannah was laid out on a grid of central squares, providing large open spaces for public gatherings and military maneuvers, which were then critical to the city's defense. Georgia was created as a colony. It was a buffer colony between the valuable plantation lands of the Carolinas uh, and Spanish Florida, who was the enemy of Great Britain. Another first for Georgia came in 1785, when Athens became the home to the first state chartered university in the young nation. There was a feeling that, uh, this kind of a Jeffersonian feeling, that you needed to have an informed, educated citizenry. So the momentum to build what would become the University of Georgia originated as a result of the American Revolution. Officially, Georgia is known as the Peach State, even though it trails both California and South Carolina in the production of that famous fruit. But Georgia, and Georgia alone, holds the bragging rights for another culinary favorite. It's the sweet Vidalia onion. And it only grows in one place, the farmlands of southern Georgia. You can't find it anywhere else in the world. The type of soil they have that gives it the unique characteristics of the onion, the sweet onion. Georgia can also claim the largest mass of exposed granite on Earth. Stone Mountain can be found just 16 miles east of Atlanta. It's home to the biggest bas-relief sculpture in the world, a solemn tribute to three heroes of the vanquished Confederacy, Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, and Stonewall Jackson. One of the most unusual things that our guests are surprised to learn is the Confederate memorial carving is actually larger than Mount Rushmore. It was begun by the same person that ended up doing the Mount Rushmore carving but yet our carving here is larger. Georgia joined the Confederacy in January 1861, three months before the first shots were fired at Fort Sumter, South Carolina. But three years would pass before Georgia witnessed the full fury of total war. The offensive began when the Union Army, under command of General William Tecumseh Sherman, laid siege to Atlanta. It made a lot of sense to burn Atlanta, to disrupt the railroads, uh, to disrupt the industry in support of the Confederate war. But Sherman wanted more than just Atlanta. He was determined to decimate the Confederacy, both in spirit and in fact. He proposed a scorched earth march across Georgia from Atlanta to coastal Savannah, with his army consuming or destroying everything in its path. Initially, however, Sherman's plan met with resistance from President Lincoln, who was up for re-election. If the campaign backfired, uh, it would have considerable political consequences. Uh, Lincoln himself that summer predicted that he would not get re-elected as his uh, party's standard bearer. The president asked Sherman to stall his march until after the general election in November 1864. It worked. Lincoln won, and Sherman's march to the sea was on. The Union columns advanced with devastating fury. Railroads were uprooted, buildings and bridges were burned, storehouses were raided, slaves were freed and joined the rear guard of the march. Sherman himself noted at the end of the march that over the course of the month or so that they were in the field, his soldiers succeeded in uh, coming up with $100 million worth of materiel uh, that had been in the Georgia countryside, taking $20 million of it to their own advantage and destroying $80 million worth of goods. 
Some 70 years later, the fall of Atlanta and the destruction of Georgia was brought back to life in one of the 20th century's most popular novels, Gone with the Wind. It was the first and only book ever written by Margaret Mitchell. Margaret Mitchell is a native of Atlanta. She won a Pulitzer Prize for Gone with the Wind in 1937. But when she wrote the book, she wrote it in secret. She never intended to be published. She never intended to show anybody else. She had grown up hearing stories about the Civil War her entire life. And she just she wrote down the stories that she'd heard and informed what has become a phenomenon throughout Georgia, the United States and the world. When Mitchell's novel was published in 1936, the South was still tainted with the prejudice and segregation that had outlived the Civil War. The tide of racial change, however, was beginning to build, even though its greatest future leader was still a young boy living in this Atlanta home. Martin Luther King Jr. was the son and grandson of Baptist ministers who helped shape his views on race. But King's true mentor was a man he met at Atlanta's Morehouse College, Benjamin Mays. Like a lot of ministers' kids, Dr. King at first didn't really want to go into ministry himself. He wanted to be a lawyer. But then Dr. Mays was also an ordained minister, and he was president of Morehouse, great educator, great speaker. Quite literally, Dr. King would not have become a minister without meeting Benny Mays. Dr. Mays was not an activist in the strictest sense of the term. The strength of his message was, in, uh, was his oratory and his writings, in which he came down very, very forcibly against uh, segregation and, and discrimination. These were not the things that the country as a whole, let alone the South, were ready to hear. In 1955, Dr. King was a key organizer of the Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott, a groundbreaking civil action that lasted just over a year. King once again turned to Benjamin Mays. When the Montgomery bus boycott was beginning, Proceeding, Dr. Mays was called upon by Dr. King for advice as to, as to strategy and, and direction. It was Dr. Mays who urged King to continue working for a nonviolent solution. The strategy worked. On December 21st, 1956, the United States Supreme Court declared the laws requiring segregation on buses unconstitutional. After Martin Luther King's assassination in 1968, his old mentor Benjamin Mays delivered the final eulogy from the chapel on the campus of Morehouse College. He drew no distinction between the high and the low, none between the rich and the poor. He belonged to the world and to mankind. Now, he belongs to posterity. The courage of men like Benjamin Mays and Martin Luther King Jr. continues to inspire Georgia today. Their lasting ideals are echoed in Atlanta's unofficial slogan, the city that's too busy to hate. This most mountainous state was once called the Switzerland of America. It's home to Leadville, at 10,430 feet above sea level, the highest incorporated city in America. Greetings from Colorado, which joined the Union as the 38th state on August 1st, 1876. It ranks 22nd in population with 4.6 million residents. You want to be outside in Colorado because you know, we're a mile high and yeah, you have to be in pretty good shape because the air is a little bit thinner up here, but you get out in the mornings and you feel that like cold, crisp air and it induces you to get out and be active and want to do something to be outside. Of all the 50 states, Colorado is the highest above sea level. Its terrain averages an elevation of 6,800 feet and no fewer than 54 of its mountains top the 14,000 foot mark. To dedicated climbers, these peaks are simply the 14ers. Of those 14,000 foot peaks, Pikes Peak is the most famous. And it was immortalized by Catherine Lee Bates, an English teacher in uh, the 1880s. When Catherine Lee Bates hiked up the mountain of Pikes Peak, she looked around her and was really inspired by what this vista told her about the United States. And she was inspired to write America the Beautiful after that hike. And everything that's in the song is everything that she saw up there. The amber waves of grain and the Purple Mountains Majesty, that's where it originally came from. When those majestic Purple Mountains turn white every winter, millions of skiers flock to Colorado slopes for the famously dry and fluffy snow. Aspen, Telluride, and Vail offer world-class skiing, providing that famous Rocky Mountain High. So it was no surprise when Denver was selected as the host city for the 1976 Winter Olympic Games. But in an unprecedented action, Colorado voters gave the Games the cold shoulder, citing concerns for the environment. A century earlier, the same crisp mountain air that skiers can't resist made Colorado a haven for those suffering from the scourge of the 19th century, tuberculosis. One of the ideas that many doctors had was that high elevation and dry air would cure tuberculosis, and what better place for that than Colorado? Of those who sought the cure, none was more infamous than John Henry Holliday. A dentist turned gambler and gunfighter, he was better known as Doc Holliday. Holliday almost certainly had some experience with Colorado jails, but he never saw anything like the administrative maximum facility in Florence, the so-called Alcatraz of the Rockies. Opened in 1994, it's the federal government's only super max prison, and it houses some of the highest profile criminals in recent history. Unabomber Ted Kaczynski, Oklahoma City bombing conspirator Terry Nichols, and 9-11 conspirator Zacharias Mosawi. Less than an hour's drive from Supermax, you'll find another unique institution with a much more noble reputation, the United States Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. Established in 1955 at the height of the Cold War, the Academy symbolizes the importance of strategic air power in the modern military. But like the other service schools, Wild Blue U, as it's sometimes called, has its own peculiar customs. Uh, the tradition here is that um, all the freshmen would have to run on the outside strips of the terrazzo. While upperclassmen walk freely on the main campus quad, every time lowly freshmen enter the area, they must run double time at right angles along its borders. The purpose is to instill discipline and camaraderie. Running the strips is supposed to build officers of character because it's putting you through hard times, getting used to life in the military. Colorado has a knack for attracting the best and the brightest, no matter what their chosen profession. 
In fact, Colorado is regarded as one of the five most educated states in the nation. There are many industries that draw highly educated people to Colorado, ranging from the federal government to the aerospace industry. Rocket scientists often have advanced degrees. But Colorado is perhaps better known for its rough and tumble side, cowboys. America's first organized rodeo was held in Deer Trail, Colorado on July 4, 1869. One of the most exciting events that day was a bronco busting contest featuring a fiercely wild horse named Montana Blizzard. Now there were black cowboys, there were Mexican cowboys, there were plenty of uh, cowboys from all parts of the United States. But interestingly enough, Emil Gardenshare, an English cowboy, managed to ride Montana Blizzard the longest. For 15 minutes, there was a blur of horse and rider. And at the end of the 15 minutes, he was still atop the horse. He's acclaimed the grand champion, bronco buster of the plains. My view of rodeo guys is that they're crazy. Uh, <laughs> we, at least we got to have shoulder pads on and helmets on. And people say football players are tough. I think the cowboys are the tough guys. The gold and silver boom of the 1860s brought in thousands of fortune seekers who added to Colorado's rugged image. Yet that era also gave the state one of its most dignified institutions, the Denver Mint. The Mint began way back in 1859 as a private bank, Clark Gruber and Company, which would buy up gold dust from the miners and turn that into $5, $10, and $20 gold pieces. In 1862, the U.S. Treasury bought Clark Gruber and Company for $25,000 and reopened it later as a government operation. Today, the Mint has an average daily output of 50 million coins. Denver Mint claims to produce more coins than any other Mint in the world, so the next time you check your quarter, look for a little D on the front. But at Peterson Air Force Base outside Colorado Springs, an entire group of people are much more concerned with a big D, as in defense, national defense to be specific. In the 1950s, with the Cold War heating up and the nuclear arms race in full swing, the U.S. and Canada chose Colorado as the headquarters of a joint operation known as NORAD, the North American Aerospace Defense Command. Its purpose? To provide first alert capabilities in the event of a Soviet attack. They knew that it was in the center of the country and that we could possibly be a buffer to any early attack. Uh, it, would, it would survive and it was initially hoped that we'd get six hours of early warning against the bomber attack. In 1963, the ongoing threat of a nuclear strike prompted NORAD to move its command and control center to a massive bunker 1,000 feet below ground. This is a huge operation uh, buried deep inside Cheyenne Mountain, just outside of Colorado Springs, where they burrowed into the mountain. The Cheyenne facility was reinforced with walls of fortified concrete and 30-ton blast-proof iron doors. However, as Cold War tensions relaxed in the 1980s and 90s, new threats emerged, and the government found new ways to utilize NORAD's technology. The emphasis of NORAD shifted somewhat to monitoring drug trafficking, and after September 11th, the monitoring of domestic airspace in the case of terrorist attacks. Whether they're defending the nation, minting its coins, busting broncos, or just enjoying the pristine beauty, Coloradans are honored to live in a place that has lofty ideals to go along with its lofty heights. I think Colorado's proud of the Rocky Mountains. The views that we have in the Rocky Mountains day in and day out are something that when you get away, you realize how much you enjoy them when you're around them. In 1854, 30 citizens met informally in this next state to organize a new political party. They became known as Republicans. Greetings from Wisconsin, which joined the Union on May 29, 1848, as the 30th state. With 5.5 million residents, Wisconsin ranks 20th in population. Wisconsin is known as the Badger State, but the origin of this nickname takes some explaining. It's not the animal that our state is named after. It's those lead miners that came into Wisconsin in the 1820s up the Mississippi River. These miners often initially dug out little homes to live in in the sides of hills. They lived like badgers, um, under the ground, burrowing away, looking for, for lead. There is no official state sport here, but if there were, a lot of Wisconsinites would vote for football. Since 1934, I have only missed one home Wisconsin game. For college ball, the University of Wisconsin at Madison is the hottest ticket in town. But you haven't really seen football until you've been to Green Bay. Fans throughout the state have a unique attachment to the NFL Packers, who got their name in 1919 when the Indian Packing Company ponied up $500 for team uniforms. The Packers are the only nonprofit, community-owned team in the league. We have no owner. We all own shares. That gives us all a sense of uh, participation in the team and its fate. Pride of ownership makes a Packers season ticket a highly prized commodity. To get a ticket for the Green Bay Packers, if you were born today, you would be somewhere around 35 years old before your name would come up in order to buy a ticket. Sometimes, however, there's as much action in the parking lot before the game as there is on the field, thanks to a phenomenon called tailgating. I think the one thing that separates our area from any other place, any place, is tailgating. You can come into the parking lot on the day of a game and see anything from weddings to bar mitzvahs to maybe a berth. There's no place that tailgates like they do here. Everybody has their own style of tailgating. I think that in Wisconsin, maybe we take it to another level. This has got a 26-inch plasma screen TV, satellite dish, tappers to dispense beer. Last week, we just put a grill on the hitch. Anything you need for a tailgate. Around here, bratwurst is one of the preferred staples for tailgating. Small wonder, since Wisconsin is known as the bratwurst capital of America. Usinger's famous sausage once held the record for the longest brat in the world. We made a 62-foot long bratwurst for our 125th anniversary that we served at German Fest. 20 plus yards of brat calls for a lot of mustard, and you'll find the world's largest collection in Mount Horeb. We have over 4,700 different mustards from all over the world. Wisconsin does have a few more notable distinctions. The Harley Davidson motorcycle was invented here in 1901 by two childhood friends from Milwaukee, William Harley and Arthur Walter Davidson. 
Not to be outdone, Carl Eliasson of Sawyer helped pioneer another specialized vehicle in 1924, the snowmobile. Today, the World Championship Snowmobile Derby is held every year in Eagle River. It's the largest snowmobile race in the world, and one of the fastest, with top speeds of up to 90 miles per hour. Each spring, however, Wisconsin returns to what it does best, farming. Nationally, it ranks first in the production of feed corn, cranberries, and ginseng. But it was dairy farms that made Wisconsin famous around the world, though it took a while to get there. Our first big crop in Wisconsin in the 1860s and 70s was wheat. But wheat really wasn't very suitable. Very soon it leached out the soils. But you could always grow grass, and that meant you could always have cows. If you're going to make money on dairy products, it's not going to be in raw milk in the 19th century. There's no refrigeration, so you convert it into something that's more durable. Wisconsin is the largest cheese producer in the United States. 25% of all cheese produced in this country is produced in Wisconsin. By 1915, Wisconsin had become the leading dairy provider in the nation. These days, 116 cheese plants churn out over 2 billion pounds of cheese a year in more than 600 varieties. In Wisconsin, it's uh, actually an honor to be uh, called a cheese head. We, we take that serious. Although its official nickname is America's Dairyland, Wisconsin might be better known as America's Beer Garden. The beer industry essentially started because of our German immigrant group. The Germans uh, brought their brewmasters with them uh, to Wisconsin. At one time, we had 400 breweries operating in Wisconsin. Every little town, nearly every little town, had a brewery. Milwaukee had 100 breweries operating at the same time. Milwaukee's leading early brewers would later become household names. Valentine Blatz, Frederick Miller, Joseph Schlitz, and Frederick Pabst. But in the late 1860s, they were all struggling to get a foothold in the national market. Schlitz got the jump on his competitors by seeing opportunity in a disaster. In 1871, the Great Chicago Fire took Chicago out of uh, play for the making of beer for a long time. And Schlitz, he was a great market person. He loaded a steamboat load of beer and shipped it to Chicago. And the Chicago people said, Schlitz, the beer that made Milwaukee famous. And it did, and that became their motto. The Pabst Company got its big break in 1893 at the Columbian Exposition in Chicago. During a beer judging, Pabst beat out Anheuser-Busch of St. Louis for the coveted Blue Ribbon. Pabst immediately went back to Milwaukee, and they bought a bunch of Blue Satin Ribbons and they hand-tied ribbons to the bottles of beer that they set out, and thus the birth of Pabst Blue Ribbon beer. By the turn of the 20th century, Milwaukee had emerged as America's leading brew center. Much of its product was shipped to ports around the world via Wisconsin's primary link to the Atlantic Ocean, the Great Lakes. If we just look to the Wisconsin State flag, we can see there's a sailor, an anchor, and a caulking mount that was used in ship construction. And this really highlights how important maritime commerce and the Great Lakes and shipping were to Wisconsin's early years. The Great Lakes are actually vast inland seas, 30 lighthouses still stand along Wisconsin's shores to guide sailors across the waters, where it's not uncommon to have hurricane force winds and 30-foot waves that can sink ships. The bottom of the lakes are littered, literally all over the coastlines, uh, with the remnants of these tragic moments. Because of the northern latitude of the Great Lakes, the water tends to remain very cold, especially on the bottom. So it acts like a preserving agent for the shipwrecks. They're literally kept in cold storage on the bottom of the lakes and well preserved. One of the 700 sunken ships that lie off Wisconsin's shores is the Rouse Simmons. On November 23, 1912, the three-masted schooner went down in a fierce gale along with its entire crew and a cargo of freshly cut Christmas trees. Almost 60 years later, divers discovered the ship nearly intact, resting in 165 feet of water. Diving the Royal Simmons is a fantastic experience because as you're coming down the, the mooring line, uh, literally you see the wreck open up below you and you can literally touch a piece of 19th century history before you. The Christmas trees themselves are still stacked neatly in the hole just as they were in 1912. Diving Wisconsin's frigid waters may seem daunting to some, but the state's cold climate is something locals embrace. Just one more reason to love their home state. The places that surround Wisconsin, Illinois, Minnesota, and places like that, the people that live in those states say, you know, when you ask them why they live there, they said so they can be close to Wisconsin, you know. So that's, the, that's why they live there. In 1872, the barren plains of this next state inspired a special tree planting day. Arbor Day is now recognized nationwide, but only here is it celebrated as a legal state holiday. Greetings from Nebraska, which became the 37th state on March 1st, 1867. It has a population of 1.7 million, ranking it 38th in the nation. When you think of the Cornhusker state, you almost automatically think of farming. Not surprisingly, corn is Nebraska's number one crop, and much of it gets converted into the state's top commodity, corn-fed beef. In fact, the state has more cattle than people and is among the nation's top five cattle producers. But Nebraska's impact on the American diet goes beyond hamburger and steak. One of the early things that we came up with was called Kool-Aid. The Swanson frozen dinner, which became the TV dinner, was produced in Omaha. But the one that most people think of is the Reuben sandwich. It is thought to have come from the Blackstone Hotel in Omaha, where a cook there devised it. One of Nebraska's more unusual distinctions is this vertical junk pile of 38 cars, just outside of Alliance. It's called Carhenge, because it is an astronomically accurate recreation of England's famously mysterious ancient monument, Stonehenge. A different kind of unusual is Nebraska's unique system of government. Since 1937, it's been the only state in the nation with a nonpartisan, unicameral, or single house legislature. The prime mover behind the idea was U.S. Senator George Norris. He believed a single house, elected without regard to party affiliation, would be more economical, efficient, and honest. 
He was interested in opening up the governmental process, making government more transparent, uh, making it more accessible, uh, making it less subservient to special interests. One of his famous lines was, in a two-house legislature, he said that the politicians hold the checks and the, the lobbyists hold the balances. Aside from politics, there's one other thing that sets Nebraska apart, farmland, and lots of it. A whopping 93% of the state's land is used for agriculture. So it's hard to believe that an 1819 explorer described this territory as a land wholly unfit for cultivation. The area once dismissed as the Great American Desert eventually became a place of bounty. John Deere's invention of the cast steel plow in 1837 made busting Nebraska's prairie sod possible and helped spark nothing less than an agricultural revolution. In 1862, nearly 40 million acres of Nebraska territory was opened up by the Homestead Act. Land was snapped up by thousands of applicants, including territorial residents and newcomers alike. If you were 21 or the head of a household or married, you could apply for a homestead, which was a quarter section of land. You would pay a filing fee of $10. Then after proving up, uh, you would get this land literally free of charge. Daniel Freeman, a soldier in the Union Army who wanted a homestead in southeastern Nebraska, was the very first to file a claim under the new law. He convinced the registrar of the land office to open up just after midnight, January 1st, when the Homestead Act went into effect so that he could file his claim and still get to his post the next day. Single women also responded to the call of free land. The Chrisman sisters of Custer County were among the earliest homesteaders. Women who wanted to take under the Homestead Act were certainly entitled to, but they had to be a head of household, which meant they had to be single. And so women, in some cases, delayed marriage uh, during the five-year proving up period to be able to take under the Act. African Americans were also able to take advantage of the opportunity. The first was Nebraskan Robert Anderson in 1886. And by the time of his death in 1930, he will hold more than 2,000 acres of Nebraskan land, and, and he will die uh, the largest African American landowner in the state. Homesteaders led a rugged existence. They lived in sod houses and slept on rope-strung beds, which incidentally may have given us a well-known nighttime salutation. Sleep tight. Don't let the bed bugs bite is the saying that you know we still say today. It's because the rope beds, um, after they've been slept on a while, they start sagging in the middle, and so they'd have to tighten their beds, and that's where the term sleep tight comes from. And bed bugs don't need much of an explanation, do they? By the 1880s, the homesteading farmers had helped bring Nebraska's Wild West days to an end. But the public's fascination with that era was still strong, and one of Nebraska's most colorful characters was quick to capitalize. His name was William Frederick Cody, the legendary Buffalo Bill. He was a soldier, a scout, a buffalo hunter, a rancher, and a showman, an entrepreneur, who in the 1880s began to develop what became his famous Wild West exhibition. Inspired by traveling shows like Bartim and Bailey's Circus, Cody launched his extravaganza in 1882, recreating the excitement of the wild frontier at his ranch in North Platte, Nebraska. The Wild West show was very carefully orchestrated. They would usually start their show uh, riding around in a circle, firing on the Indians and chasing them down and killing them off. Cody hired Sitting Bull, Geronimo, and other noted tribal leaders to appear in his shows. He even went so far as to reenact Custer's defeat at Little Bighorn, among other major battles. When the show toured before the crown heads of Europe, the Indians were a main attraction. They were very popular. Uh, many of the people in Europe particularly had never seen an Indian. By the time of his death in 1917, Buffalo Bill was one of the most recognizable celebrities in the world. The scout's rest ranch he called home is now a state historic park dedicated to his independent spirit, a spirit he maintained to the very end. Legend has it that Bill's dying words expressed a sentiment which is no doubt shared by many Nebraskans today. Let my show go on. During the War of 1812, a coastal village in this next state outfoxed the British fleet by hoisting lanterns into treetops and ship masts. The British cannons aimed for the lanterns and missed the town completely. Greetings from Maryland, one of the original 13 colonies. It became the seventh state to join the Union on April 28, 1788. It's over five and a half million people make it the 19th most populous state in America. One of Maryland's most treasured landmarks is the Baltimore Basilica, America's first Catholic cathedral. It was designed by Benjamin Latrobe, the father of American architecture, who also created the U.S. Capitol. At the time of its completion in 1821, the Basilica was considered a monument to the state's founding principle of religious freedom, a fact not lost on Maryland native comedian Louis Black. The people from the state of Maryland uh, call themselves uh, um, the Chosen, actually. Um, Jews, of which I'm one, consider themselves the Chosen, but we in Maryland uh, would like, when we privately talk among each other, say, we are the Chosen. We usually do it very quietly. Indeed, Marylanders do pride themselves on being special and point to an eclectic group of luminaries who hail from the state, including jazz singer Billie Holiday, rock star Frank Zappa, and Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. And if they were alive today, they probably disagree on the answer to an age-old Maryland question. Maryland is very definitely a southern state. Probably more northern than southern. Maryland is, a, is, a, is both northern and southern. It's a border state. It was split uh, in the uh, Civil War. Maryland never seceded from the Union, even though many of its residents were staunch Confederate sympathizers. In fact, the first blood of the Civil War was spilled on the streets of Baltimore, when Union soldiers heading to Washington marched through the city from one train station to another. April 18th, 1861. Troops were coming into Baltimore to protect Washington. April 19th, more troops came, the 6th Massachusetts. And when they came, they were met by an angry mob of Southern sympathizers. Many Marylanders viewed the federal troops as an invading army and attacked, throwing paving stones and shooting pistols. The terrified soldiers fired back. Four of them were killed, along with about a dozen civilians. 
The next month, President Lincoln declared martial law. They arrested the mayor, they arrested prominent men in the city, and they were basically held at Fort McHenry um, until the end of the war because they could not be trusted. One of those imprisoned in Fort McHenry was the grandson of Francis Scott Key, a Marylander who gained lasting fame by writing a poem called The Star-Spangled Banner. Key composed his memorable lyric after witnessing the British bombardment of the fort during the War of 1812. At 6.30 a.m. on September 13, 1814, the British fleet started to bombard Fort McHenry. They fired huge 13-inch, 200-pound bombs and 36-pound rockets for over 25 hours. When the Battle of Baltimore ended at 7 a.m., when the last bomb and rocket flew over the ramparts of Fort McHenry, nobody in Baltimore knew what had happened. Did we win? Did we lose? Francis Scott Key was asking himself the very same question. The answer came when the Americans raised their flag over the fort. We won. The British were leaving. And so it's at that moment that, overcome with emotion, Key just starts to write down what he was thinking and feeling. It just spills out of him. Certainly, Francis Scott Key never imagined that his words would one day be sung at Camden Yards before every Baltimore Orioles ballgame. But the atmosphere here goes beyond local pride in the origins of the national anthem. For baseball fans, Camden Yards itself is hallowed ground. Babe Ruth was uh, born right here in Baltimore, two and a half blocks from our ballpark, and he grew up just behind second base. Center field at Camden Yards was the exact location of Babe Ruth's father's tavern, where the young Ruth lived until he was seven years old. The Orioles have been a Maryland passion since joining the major leagues in the 1950s. So you'd think that baseball might be the state's official team sport, right? Wrong. Maryland's official game originated with the Native Americans. Lacrosse is our team state sport. It's the oldest team sport in North America, and um, it's been played in Maryland for about 100 years. It's the fastest game on two feet, and it involves the skills and strategy of basketball, the hand-eye coordination of hockey, some of the strategies on the physical play of football. It appeals to a lot of different types of people that are interested in different sports. Another popular sport in Maryland is fox hunting. It combines the state's love for horses and the outdoors with the thrill of the chase. The fun is to jump the fences, gallop across the fields, go through the woods on the trails, and stay with the hounds until the end of the chase. And the end of the chase ends one of two ways in this country. Either the fox goes in his hole, and he's safe in there, or he just evaporates and we can't find him. For me, it's about the hounds, and it's about um, watching them do their job and make an effort. You need to be a pretty damn good horse. You better have a good horse, and you better be able to ride it, or you're either not going to make it, or you're going to get hurt, or something untoward might happen. Another Maryland tradition that's almost as old as fox hunting is the annual tossing of the caps by new graduates of the U.S. Naval Academy. The Academy makes its home in Annapolis, a colonial city that boasts the oldest state house in the country still in legislative use. Annapolis sits near the Chesapeake Bay, the great body of water that divides the state into two distinct territories that have one thing in common. People come to Maryland and they must eat a crab. And part of it is not just the sweet meat that comes out of the crab, it's the whole social event with eating the crabs. There was a slogan, uh, and it must have been for about eight minutes, and uh, which was Maryland's for crabs, which was really, um, even a 15-year-old would get that there's some sort of a very bad uh, kind of innuendo there that is totally unnecessary for a state to put on itself. Within the borders of Maryland, you'll find a unique tract of land, 61 square miles, ceded to the nation from the state. It is a city where some of America's most powerful people work and where some of the world's most important decisions are made. Yet the thousands of U.S. citizens who live here exist in a kind of democratic limbo. It's the District of Columbia. We have the burdens of statehood without any of the prerogatives and privileges and the fundamental rights of all those other states in the Union. Some people say they want Washington, D.C. as a 51st state. I say I want Washington, D.C. to have full representation, which would basically make us a city-state in that we would have two senators and a voting congressional representative. The district is represented by one member of Congress, now in her eighth term. But while Eleanor Holmes Norton carries the responsibilities of office, can vote in committees, and is called Congresswoman, she does not have the right to vote on the House floor. In this most essential, basic right in a democracy, the right to vote, to have somebody to vote one way or the other before, people are sent to war. That right, District of Columbia residents have never had. Over the years, various plans have been put forth that fall short of full statehood, but would allow D.C. citizens a voice in Congress. It's even been suggested that the city should be given back to Maryland. But so far, the idea has received little support. For the moment, the state and the district remain separate entities, joined together in spirit by a common heritage and history.